In the vast tapestry of Rome's illustrious history, few names resonate as powerfully as Scipio Africanus. A military genius, his strategic brilliance was unmatched, and his encounters with the formidable Hannibal of Carthage have become the stuff of legends. But who was this man, really? Beyond the battlefield, what drove him, and how did he navigate the treacherous waters of Roman politics? Today, on History Uncovered, we'll journey through the annals of time, retracing Scipio's steps from his early days to his final moments. We'll explore his triumphs, challenges, and the indelible mark he left on the Roman Empire. So, sit back and immerse yourself in the world of ancient Rome, as we unravel the captivating tale of Scipio Africanus, a general whose legacy still echoes through the ages. Born in 236 BC, Scipio Africanus was originally named Publius Cornelius Scipio. He hailed from the illustrious Cornelii Scipioni's family, a prominent patrician lineage with a history of holding significant political positions. Notably, his great-grandfather, Lucius Cornelius Scipio Barbatus, and his grandfather, Lucius Cornelius Scipio, had both served as consuls and censors. Scipio's father had been a consul in 218 BC, while his uncle took on the role in 222 BC further showcasing the family's prominence, Scipio's maternal uncles, Manius Pomponius Matho and Marcus Pomponius Matho, held consulships in 233 and 231 BC, respectively. The Second Punic War erupted in the spring of 218 BC when Carthage, led by Hannibal, refused Rome's demand to withdraw from Saguntum in Spain. That year, Scipio's father held the position of consul, and the young Scipio joined him to counter Hannibal's advance towards Italy. During a brief cavalry skirmish near the river Ticinus, close to present-day Pavia, it's said by Polybius that Scipio heroically rescued his father, who was surrounded by enemy forces. However, some accounts attribute this act of bravery to an unnamed Ligurian slave. By 216 BC, Scipio had risen to the rank of military tribune. He was one of the few to survive the catastrophic Battle of Cannae, where his father-in-law, Consul Lucius Emilius Paulus, tragically lost his life. Following the battle, Scipio took charge, gathering the remnants of the Roman forces at Canusium. Livy recounts a dramatic episode where Scipio, upon learning that some young noblemen, including Lucius Cassilius Metellus, were contemplating deserting Rome to become mercenaries, burst into their gathering. With a drawn sword, he compelled them to swear an oath to Jupiter and the Capitoline Triad, pledging their unwavering loyalty to Rome. However, this tale's authenticity is debated, as it's absent from Polybius's accounts. In 213 BC, Scipio's political career advanced when he was elected curule aedile, serving alongside his cousin, Marcus Cornelius Cethegus. His election faced opposition from a plebeian tribune, citing Scipio's youth and ineligibility due to age. Yet, the overwhelming public support for Scipio silenced the objections. From 218 to 211 BC, Spain was the battleground where Scipio's father and uncle, Gnaeus Cornelius Scipio Calvus, led the Roman forces against Carthaginian dominance. Their campaign was marked by significant successes, particularly when the Carthaginians were distracted by a revolt initiated by Syphax of Numidia. Over these pivotal seven years, the Scipio brothers managed to push Roman control deep into territories previously held by Carthage. However, 211 BC was a dark year for the Romans in Spain. In a strategic move that would prove fatal, the Scipio brothers divided their forces to confront three separate Carthaginian armies. They were defeated in individual battles. The Carthaginian commanders, Hasdrubal and Mago Barca and Hasdrubal Gisco, proved too formidable. The Roman brothers met their tragic end in these confrontations. In the wake of this setback, Rome dispatched Gaius Claudius Nero to stabilize the deteriorating situation. But by 210 BC, recognizing the need for a change in leadership, the assembly elected the young Scipio to take the helm. This decision was groundbreaking. Scipio, despite his youth and lack of significant political office, was granted proconsular authority, an unprecedented move in Roman history. With a reinforced army of 10,000, he set foot in Spain, soon joined by another commander, Marcus Junius Silanus. Scipio's leadership was soon put to the test in 209 BC when he targeted Carthago Nova, a pivotal Carthaginian stronghold. 
Displaying tactical genius, he captured the city by sending a detachment across a lagoon during low tide. He claimed this strategy was inspired by a divine vision from Neptune, the sea god. This event, coupled with his decisive actions in the city, began to cultivate a legendary aura around Scipio and his lineage. The fall of Carthago Nova had a ripple effect. Several Spanish tribes, seeing the tide turn, pledged their allegiance to Rome. By 208 BC, Scipio's forces met Hasdrubal's near the river Betis. While the battle ended in a Roman victory, Hasdrubal managed to slip away, making his way to Italy. However, his escape was short-lived, as he met his end in the Battle of the Metaurus in 207 BC. In the subsequent years, Scipio, with the aid of other Roman commanders, continued to reclaim Spain from Carthaginian hands, capturing pivotal cities and winning crucial battles. Around 206 BC, amidst these military campaigns, Scipio laid the foundation for the town of Italica. This town would later gain fame as the birthplace of renowned Roman emperors Trajan, Hadrian, and Theodosius I. Having solidified Roman control over Spain, Scipio returned to Rome in 205 BC. However, his triumphant return was marred by political challenges. Despite his monumental achievements, he was denied a triumph due to the intricacies and technicalities of his official status. In 205 BC, Scipio, despite being technically underage at 31, was unanimously elected to the esteemed position of consul, a testament to his rising stature and popularity. Upon assuming office, he made a bold demand to the Senate. He wanted the province of Africa under his command. When faced with resistance, he didn't hesitate to assert that he'd take the matter to the popular assemblies if the Senate declined. Quintus Fabius Maximus Variacosus, the influential princeps senatus, was a staunch opponent of this move. Fabius' resistance could have stemmed from envy of Scipio's growing acclaim, but it's also worth noting the historical context. A previous campaign in Africa around 255 BC, led by Marcus Atilius Regulus during the First Punic War, had ended disastrously, rejuvenating Carthaginian war efforts. Despite Fabius' reservations, the Senate eventually conceded to Scipio's demands, granting him Sicily with the option to venture into Africa if deemed necessary. However, they didn't provide him with additional troops. Undeterred, Scipio rallied an army of volunteers. According to Livy, his vast network of supporters and clients across Italy enabled him to amass a fleet of 30 warships and an army of 7,000 men. During his consulship, Scipio primarily focused on readying his Sicilian troops for the impending African invasion. That year, he also managed to seize Locri, located at the southern tip of Italy. However, the appointment of one Plaminius to oversee Locri would lead to controversy. Plaminius, abusing his position, plundered the city's temple and committed heinous acts against two military tribunes. The Senate, horrified by these actions, arrested Plaminius. Scipio, due to his association, found himself under scrutiny but was exonerated the following year. In 205 BC, with his authority extended, Scipio made his move into Africa, laying siege to Utica. However, he soon pulled back, feigning negotiations with the Carthaginians during the winter. This ruse allowed him to gather intelligence on enemy encampments. Capitalizing on this information, Scipio launched a surprise night attack, decimating the enemy camps and inflicting heavy casualties. The subsequent Battle of the Great Plains saw Scipio's forces emerge victorious. They captured the Numidian king, Syphax, and reinstated Massinissa to the throne. In response, Carthage recalled its formidable generals, Hannibal and Mago, from Italy and dispatched its fleet to disrupt Scipio's supply lines. While Scipio faced a challenging naval confrontation near Utica, he managed to mitigate the damage, losing only a fraction of his transport ships. Peace talks ensued, with Carthage seemingly willing to make significant concessions, relinquishing territorial claims outside Africa, limiting their expansion within Africa, recognizing Massinissa's reign, drastically reducing their naval fleet, and agreeing to a war indemnity. However, a desperate act by the starving Carthaginians, attacking a Roman food convoy, complicated the negotiations. While Scipio's successes made him a hero, they also attracted envy. 
several Roman officials, including the consul of 203 BC, Nius Servilius Cipio, sought to replace Scipio to claim the glory of defeating Carthage for themselves. Despite these political maneuvers, Scipio remained resolute. In 202 BC, he met with Hannibal for peace talks but declined the terms. The subsequent Battle of Zama, aided by Massinus's Numidian cavalry, saw the Romans triumph, leading Carthage to once again seek peace. By 201 BC, Scipio was finalizing peace negotiations. The terms were stringent, Carthage would retain its pre-war territories, return all captured assets and prisoners to Rome, disarm its navy save for ten triremes, and seek Roman approval for any future wars. Additionally, Massinus's rule in Numidia was recognized, and Carthage was to pay a hefty war indemnity over the next half-century. While Nius Cornelius Lentulus, the consul of 201 BC, attempted to prolong the war by opposing the peace terms, the Roman assembly ratified the agreement, marking the end of the war. Upon his triumphant return to Rome, Scipio was honored with a grand triumph for his victories over Hannibal, the Carthaginians, and Syphax. It was during these celebrations that he adopted the agnomen Africanus, signifying his conquests in Africa. By this time, even though he was just in his early thirties, Scipio's achievements had eclipsed those of many of his contemporaries. In a gesture of magnanimity and to further cement his reputation, Scipio deposited an impressive 123,000 pounds of silver into the Roman treasury. Additionally, he generously distributed 400 asses to each of his soldiers, further boosting his popularity. The Roman commoners held Scipio in high regard. The legend surrounding him grew, with later tales even portraying him as a son of Jupiter, the king of the Roman gods. This immense popularity paved the way for significant political success. However, as is often the case with rapid ascents to power, Scipio's rise also garnered him a fair share of detractors. Many Roman aristocrats, either wary of his increasing influence or simply envious of his accomplishments, became his adversaries. Notably, Fabius Maximus had been a vocal critic, especially after rumors spread that Scipio was hailed as both a king and a god during his time in Spain. Despite the political turbulence and the challenges posed by his adversaries, Scipio's vision for his role in Roman politics remained rooted in tradition. In 199 BC, Scipio was elected to the role of censor, serving alongside Publius Aelius Paetus. While their term as censors didn't produce any particularly noteworthy events, Scipio did earn the title of Princeps Senatus, a prestigious position he held for the next ten years. Some historians, like Howard Hayes Scullard, argue that this period marked a decline in Scipio's political influence, although this view is contested. By 194 BC, the mandatory ten-year gap between consulships had passed, and Scipio was once again elected consul. He had ambitions to succeed Titus Quinctius Flamininus in Greece and pushed for an expanded Roman footprint in the Aegean to counter the threat posed by Antiochus III. However, these plans did not come to fruition. Instead, Scipio found himself engaged in military campaigns against the Boi and Ligurians in northern Italy, a region where Roman forces had been active since 201 BC in these endeavors. He allowed his co-consul, Tiberius Sempronius Longus, to take the lead, while he returned to Rome to oversee the consular elections. In 193 BC, Scipio is reported to have participated in two diplomatic missions. The first took him to Africa, where he was part of a tripartite commission tasked with resolving a territorial dispute between Carthage and Massinissa. The commission left the issue unresolved, possibly intentionally. The second mission was purportedly to Asia, although the timeline for such a journey raises questions about its authenticity. According to apocryphal accounts, during this supposed mission, Scipio had a conversation with Hannibal at Ephesus, where they discussed the qualities of great military leaders. In 192 BC, tensions between Rome and Antiochus escalated into a full-blown conflict. Antiochus, after a period of cold relations with Rome following the conclusion of the Second Macedonian War, made the bold move of invading Greece. However, his invasion was met with resistance, not just from Roman forces, but also from the local Greek populace. 
the Greeks, having recently experienced the benevolence of Roman rule and the proclamation of their freedom, were reluctant to support Antiochus, especially since he had to resort to force to capture certain cities. By 191 BC, the Roman consul Manius Acilius Glabrio arrived on the scene and swiftly dealt Antiochus a significant blow at the Battle of Thermopylae. This defeat forced Antiochus to retreat across the Aegean to Ephesus, marking a rapid reversal of his ambitions within just six months of the war's onset. The following year, 190 BC, saw Scipio Africanus' brother, Lucius Cornelius Scipio, take the consulship. He was assigned to Greece with the authority to venture into Asia if necessary. Recognizing the value of his elder brother's experience and expertise, Lucius appointed Scipio Africanus as one of his legates. As the Roman forces advanced, they quickly overpowered Antiochus' defenses, pushing him further back from key strategic points like the Hellespont and Abydus. By the time the Scipio brothers arrived in October 190 BC, Roman forces had already established a strong presence in Asia Minor. Antiochus, sensing the tide turning against him, attempted to negotiate peace by offering terms, including a war indemnity and relinquishing claims to certain territories. However, the Scipio brothers, aiming to reshape the Aegean's balance of power in Rome's favor, rejected these terms. They countered with demands that were far more stringent, effectively asking Antiochus to cede all territories up to the Taurus Mountains and cover the entire war's cost. These demands were so extreme that Antiochus immediately ended the negotiations. The climax of this conflict occurred around mid-December 190 BC at the Battle of Magnesia. Despite Antiochus' numerical advantage, his army, consisting of around 60,000 men, was decisively defeated by the Romans. In the aftermath of this battle, Antiochus, in a desperate bid, tried to bribe Scipio Africanus for favorable peace terms, but was rebuffed. Although Scipio Africanus claimed illness during the battle, he was still chosen to present the Roman peace terms. The victory's credit, however, went to his brother and commander, Lucius. The peace terms, presented at Sardis, mirrored the Roman demands before the battle. Antiochus was to relinquish all territories outside the Taurus line, pay a hefty war indemnity to Rome and Eumenes, and hand over all of Rome's exiles and enemies, including the famed Carthaginian general, Hannibal. The 190s BC was a tumultuous period in Roman politics, marked by the aristocracy's efforts to curb individual ambitions. The Scipiones' return to Rome was met with skepticism. Critics argued that Lucius Scipio's triumph was undeserved, suggesting that the real victory over Antiochus had been achieved a year earlier at Thermopylae. Despite the controversy, Lucius' triumph was sanctioned. Lucius' subsequent attempt to extend his authority to oversee the settlement of Asia was denied, adhering to the post hannibalic war policy against pro-magistrates. Adopting the title Asia Genes, Lucius showcased the vast wealth he had acquired during his campaign, including an enormous amount of silver, gold coins, and other treasures. This display of wealth was distributed among his soldiers as bonuses, but it also sparked concerns in Rome. The influx of such vast riches raised fears about potential misuse of these funds for personal extravagance. This period saw a series of legal challenges targeting the Scipiones. The heart of these challenges revolved around the proper use of war spoils and the extent of power that magistrates could wield abroad. Lucius Scipio, now known as Asia Genes, faced indictment, and while he was eventually fined, he claimed poverty and refused to pay. He was saved from imprisonment only through the intervention of a plebeian tribune, believed to be Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus. Scipio Africanus also faced scrutiny. In the Senate, he was asked to present his financial records from the Antiochene campaign. In a defiant gesture, Africanus tore up the account books in front of the senators, questioning their audacity to challenge him over a fraction of the wealth he had brought to Rome through his conquests. Another account, provided by Valerius Antius, suggests that Scipio Africanus was accused of bribery and theft, possibly instigated by Cato the Elder. In a dramatic turn, Africanus reminded the assembly of his victory at the Battle of Zama and led a spontaneous procession to the temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus, leaving his accusers red-faced. However, the authenticity of this account is debated. 
Despite these legal challenges, the Scipiones remained influential. Their allies continued to secure high-ranking positions, and the family's influence persisted. Scipio Africanus eventually retired to Laternum, but contrary to some narratives, this was not a retreat in disgrace, but rather a dignified withdrawal from the political limelight. Scipio Africanus, the illustrious Roman general, chose a peaceful retirement at his Laternum estate on the Campanian coast. His death, however, has been a point of contention among historians. While contemporaries like Polybius and Rutilius pinpoint his death to 183 BC, a later historian, Valerius Antius, suggests it was in 187 BC Livy, another historian, disputes both these claims. Suggesting Scipio passed away around 185 BC, he bases this on the idea that Scipio would have been recognized as the princeps senatus had he lived until 183 BC. Additionally, Livy contends that Scipio must have been present in 185 BC to face prosecution by the tribune Naevius. Yet, Many modern references, including the Oxford Classical Dictionary, favor the 183 BC date. The mystery doesn't end there. The exact location of Scipio's burial remains elusive. While the tomb of the Scipios in Rome would be a logical choice, there is no direct evidence to confirm this. Another possibility is his villa at Laternum. The philosopher Seneca the Younger, who later owned this villa, once wrote suggesting that an altar on the property might be Scipio's tomb. Lastly, there's the Metaromuli, a pyramid which was inaccurately dubbed the Sepulchrum Scipiones during the Renaissance. The true burial site of Scipio continues to be a subject of intrigue, adding to the enigmatic legacy of this legendary Roman figure. As we close the chapter on the life and mysteries surrounding Scipio Africanus, we're reminded of the countless tales history has to offer. Thank you for watching this episode of History Uncovered. If you found this video informative and engaging, please like and subscribe to our channel for more fascinating stories from the past. Your support helps us delve deeper into history's rich tapestry. And don't forget to ring the bell for notifications so that you never miss a new video. As always, we aim to bring the past to life, one story at a time. Before you go, the algorithm suggests another captivating episode for you. On the screen now is a video we think you'll truly enjoy.